Laura Cassidy from the American Medical Society. Welcome to this news briefing from ACS's 200. Gabriel Veith from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. He's studying lithium ion batteries that can't catch fire because they harden on impact. Dr. Veith? Oh, thank you. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so our technology and our the work that we're trying to work to complete is making lithium ion batteries safer. Right now, there's a large problem associated with the probability of catching fire in case of a mechanical event. So if you have a car crash where you penetrate the battery or crush the battery, if the electrodes touch each other, all the energy is released spontaneously, and that's often given off as heat. And in a lithium-ion battery, they use an organic solvent that has a, a low flash point. So the heat will cause the battery to catch on fire and the resulting you know, fires that you see on videos and internet. So what we're trying to do is reimagine how you can make an electrolyte from something that you fear to something that you need that's intrinsic to the safety of the battery. So what we've done is we are inventing materials which are a liquid under normal conditions. And so they can go in your battery and your battery will function as you normally would have it function. But upon hitting it or having some sort of external event like a crush or a penetration, the material undergoes a massive rheological change to go from a liquid to a solid. And that going from a solid to a solid prevents the electrodes from touching each other. And if they can't touch each other, then they can't uh, release all the energy at once and cause a, a fire. The other benefit is this rheological change kills the ionic conductivity, and that cuts off ion transport, so that gives you a second way to improve the safety of the battery. And the third thing is we're adding an inorganic ceramic to this, and this inorganic ceramic has a very high heat capacity, so that if you do have a crush event, you do get a short in the battery, and you do get some heat released. Now you have to heat up the inorganic ceramic to get it to the hot enough so that you get the flash point. So you have three mechanisms improving the safety of the battery. The other thing is, so now that we have this electrolyte, we know how it functions, the big advance that we've been working on is integrating it into existing manufacturing capabilities. So lithium ion battery facilities are expensive and they run at a low cost margin. So what we're trying to do is develop a process that could just simply be added into the existing manufacturing line without worrying about added costs. So in this work we're talking about today, we have developed a way to pre-position the ceramic particles in the plastic separator that keeps the electrodes apart under normal conditions. And then when you backfill the electrolyte into it, it will function as normal. And this is important because you can't simply inject a shear thickening electrolyte. You've ever played with cornstarch and water, it's a liquid under normal circumstances, but when you push on it, it becomes a solid. Same thing, if you were to try to push that solid into a battery, it would destroy your syringes and destroy the pumps. So our invention is to pre-position things so you can add the electrolyte and have it prepared in situ, and then the battery is ready to roll. Are there any questions? Please state your name and affiliation before asking your question. So it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry magazine. I guess um, one question is, if this works on impact, how do you stop, what, what kind of impact would be needed to actually get this um, shear thickening effect to happen. I mean, is there a danger that if it's overly sensitive, you know, just a simple knock? Could so that's a good point. So if you were driving down the road, you don't want your electrolyte to turn into a brick every time you were, you know, going over a pothole in Boston or a gravel road. Um, so we work on controlling it so the rheological response comes in only at very high shear rates. Something that would be simulating a car crash, um, some sort of blunt in force projection, something that would have many Gs of force associated with it. So it's not just walking down the road or you know jogging or something like that. It would not, we're trying to make the electrolyte so it doesn't shorten that way or uh, stiffen in those conditions. And it's an irre a reversible effect, is it, as well? Currently it's reversible. We have some ideas on how to make it irreversible because then you could have the, the part that was damaged become permanently isolated and that would protect it and, and isolate it so that the rest of the battery could still function and get you down the road or do whatever you need to do. But the part that was damaged then becomes isolated and it does not function. So what sort of ideas have you got to actually prevent it you know, from, from uh, become from reversible, from stopping like that? So we're working on a lot of stuff with polymers that would go undergo an irreversible sort of polymerization reaction where you would lose the, the liquid-like state and form a solid uh, type configuration. 
Um, now, the, one of the benefit of this as well is if you imagine a lithium-ion battery right now in an electric vehicle, they're carrying around seven, several hundred pounds of armor around that battery to protect it from an impact. And that several hundred pounds of armor is just simply dead weight that's being dragged around. And so if you could take away some of that dead weight, now you are giving your battery more, you're using your battery more for moving distance rather than just weight, which gives you a lot more functionality to it. Can you say exactly what the materials are? I'm trying to get my head around. Because there's a picture in the press release and it's saying um, about powdered silica and I'm wondering what exactly is the additive? What, what so are the it, materials that you're using? Good question. A lot of what we're doing right now are uh, ceramic particles like silicon dioxide, uh, aluminum dioxide, or uh, AL203, aluminum oxide. Um, we're also doing some stuff with uh, polymeric materials. The important thing on these materials is that they're perfectly spherical and very homogeneously dispersed. So the idea of shear thickening has been known for a long time. It occurs uh, in all sorts of industries, and there's a lot of work to try to prevent it from happening in places like paper mills or pumping slurries and things like that, because if you have a solid, it will destroy your pumps. We're, those are all under aqueous conditions. Our work is under a protic condition, so it's an electrolyte that has no free protons on it like water does. So this is, uh, the solvent molecules are things like ethylene carbonate and dimethyl carbonate, which are, are typical battery solvents. And then there is a salt in it that's called lithium hexafluorophosphate, so LiPF6. This, this, these electrolytes are used in the lithium ion battery now. We are using those currently. We're just adding this ceramic to this formulation and having it disperse and stabilize in that that standard electrolyte you use in your lithium ion batteries. And does that have any effect on performance or so, weight or? So it has a small effect on weight because the, the, the silicon dioxide that we're using right now is a little bit heavier than the standard electrolyte. The electrolyte has a density of about 1.4 grams per cubic centimeter. Silica has a density of closer to two grams per centimeter. So you have a small penalty in terms of weight, but you can offset that if you look at the system level by being able to take away some of that 200 pounds of armor that surrounds your battery. Um, in terms of performance, it does lower, the first generation has lowered ionic conductivity slightly, but you can still cycle the battery at a, appropriate rates for your industrial or your automotive usage and stuff like that. Um, typically, you try to run a battery at what's called a C over three rate, which means you can discharge or charge your battery in three hours, and we can do that no problem. We can charge and discharge a battery in under 30 minutes and still maintain performance. If you go at higher rates than that, say you try to charge the battery in 10 minutes, you do suffer a penalty because there is a slightly lower ionic conductivity. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bela Buslik, ACS. Um, as I understand, uh, the electrolytes in, in lithium batteries are organic compounds, uh, flammable and all that. Uh, of course, the logical thing, uh, thing going back to the lead acid stuff, the uh, water isn't good to ignite on, uh, on you. Uh, with lithium, that's not exactly the, uh, the desirable thing. Um, why not look for, if, if for a, a, a kind of a gel type electrolyte like the polysiloxane uh, that's functionalized sufficiently uh, that it's virtually a membrane or, or, or rather than, uh, than trying to use a flammable thing. Siloxanes in general don't, don't catch on fire. I, I know uh, lithium can, but, uh, but you know, with the confinement, that's, uh, that's the least likely possibility. Um, that, that's a good question. Um, people have looked at a lot of different materials. And there are, with lithium ion batteries, it's trying to get the maximum out of a bad combination of properties. So what you need is, your electrolyte does more than just move ions around. It participates in what's in forming what's known as the solid electrolyte interface, which is a passivation layer that forms on your anode. And that prevents your anode from falling apart and cycling. So it's, it's a chemical goo, if you will, that coats that particular electrode. If you have your polymers, oftentimes you don't get that chemical goo that form the same stable electrode. On the flip side, on the cathode side, 
you need some of the, the salts in your lithium ion battery electrolyte in order to passivate the aluminum current collector so that it doesn't corrode as you start cycling it. So there's a complex balance that you're trying to strike with all the different materials in order to get the best lifetime safety and performance out of your material. The polysiloxanes, I don't know their ionic connectivities, but generally the gels have lower ionic connectivities than the liquid electrolytes, and that's a function of the viscosity. And so when you start going to some of these other ones, these, you can gain in terms of ionic transference, so more ions will move and less anions will be dragged along, but you get, to, in, the, in the totality of it, it has a lower ionic connectivity, which affects your performance. Okay. Thank you. Um, did I, uh, I understand the, uh, the rationale using, uh, using lithium uh, because of weight and all that thing, but then there, uh, there are, batteries that have been reported way into the future, uh, like like aluminum or something of the sort, which is uh, being a trivalent uh, metal, you, you really get uh, get higher energy densities. It's a little heavier per, per, per unit uh, unit energy, but still, uh, still, uh, uh, do you? It may not be a fair question, but uh, to you, uh, but still. Uh, you, you see anything uh, possible with with something like that, where where you concentrate on something of higher energy density per per unit weight, essentially lower volumes. Really, mm -hmm. there's a lot of potential materials that could be used, and there's a lot of research going into that. A lot of these things all have problems, right? So finding an electrolyte that works with a trivalent aluminum is a difficult thing to do. Well, yeah. Finding uh, electrodes that would be compatible with a trivalent electro, electro, aluminum, that's a difficult thing to do. Um, there's, every time you work on one problem, that opens up 20 other problems in lithium ion batteries. And so every time you try to deal with one thing, you make one thing better, but you might negatively affect five other things. So in terms of the advanced energy material, the advanced electrodes and advanced electrolytes, there's a lot of work going on in that right now. Uh, it's very fundamental in trying to understand just, say, how the aluminum is solvating in an aprotic electrolyte and how would it restrip and plate. These are, these are tough questions that people are just starting to start probing. Um, and then I think for the lithium ion side, in terms of energy density, there's more work going towards more of a sulfur-based cathode where it's going to be really cheap and really light. You have a lower voltage, but you have much more capacity out of it. And so there's, there are some changes depending on what you're trying to do. If you're going for power, you're going to need a oxide. If you're going to be going for weight and energy density, you go to something else. So you, it's going to depend on the applications as well. Thank you. So we have an online question from Pranav Kulkarni, who's a researcher. And they were wondering, what is your stand on solid state batteries? And how long will it take to come in smartphone and electric vehicles? So, so kind of I think solid state batteries are going to be a key technology for the future. The, my stand is, since I do work on solid state batteries, I think they're fantastic. The big limitation right now is the ability to control the interfaces with lithium metal and the ceramic as well as developing the processing and the tools needed to make the ceramics in a thin, pinhole-free, uniform membrane that could be used in a lithium-ion battery with high reliability. So. And how long will, do you think it would take for your batteries to come to market, do you think? Ah, so um, our batteries, we believe, are a drop-in technology. and. In order to go, we were envisioning something going into a military application where it's a one to two year lifetime and a more rapid turnover. To go into an automotive application, it's going to be at least 10 years because what they have right now in the pipeline for batteries in 2029 have already been decided. And so that technology is locked in and they're building their infrastructure in order to produce and prepare the batteries. But if you're looking at something down the line beyond that, it, before it goes into a vehicle, 10 years at least. It, we think it can go into something much shorter for, uh, say, uh, uh, military applications. We have these visions of making a ballistic vest 
that has batteries embedded in it. And that would have the benefit of being able to take out some of the heavy ceramic and replace it with a battery that you're going to be carrying around anyways. And so that would lighten the load on the soldier and give some more functionality out of it. Um, unfortunately, they'll probably just give the soldier more food and tell him to stay out for an extra two days. But it would add some more functionality to that sort of thing. And we think that could go into a marketplace in a much shorter period of time. Any other questions? How would the cost of these batteries compare with regular lithium ion ones? So the addition of the, the colloidal silica adds a few cents per pack. Um, but that cost is more than offset if you could remove the steel and armor around your, your battery in your car, um, which is on the order of several hundred dollars worth of steel that you're carrying around. So if you could offset that with a few dollars worth of, of um, colloidal silica, then you'd be able to win in terms of the dollar. And you look at the system-wide impact rather than just a cell level cost. All right. Yes. could offset quite a bit of steel, yes. It could reduce the car weight. It would reduce the car weight significantly. Oh, so that would improve, again, sort of efficiencies. It would improve efficiency and vehicle yeah. range significantly over what you The other thing it would you could imagine is instead of putting your battery in the most important part of your car where you can put people in the middle, say, right under the, you know, where that, that little slot is in between the car that the hump that the kids don't want to put their feet on, there is, that space is valuable. But you put the battery in there because it's the most protected. But if you can remove some of that and move the battery around, that gives you more functionality and that gives you more utility out of your vehicle and more design opportunities in your vehicle than what you have right now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Dr. Vaith. My pleasure. The archived version of this session will soon be posted at bit.ly backslash ACS Live underscore Boston 2018. This has been our final news briefing from ACS's 256th National Meeting and Exposition. We hope that you have enjoyed these briefings and thank you for your attendance and participation.